thinking I thought it was darker than before. <laughs> On the 29th of November 2003, I was working with a group of cavers carrying out some conservation work in a cave called Goat Church Cavern on the Mendip Hills. Um, You'll see on there, Goat Church is a sort of top. Uh, no. <coughs> Goat Church Cavern is on the top side of the Mendip Hills. We've also got the location of two other caves on there that I'll be referring to later, both of them on the south side of the hills. During the course of the work, we found some marks that didn't appear to be recent in origin, and further cleaning revealed three finely cut marks resembling the letter W. Not easy to see on there, and that gives you some idea of actually what it's like underground as well. They're very much not easy to see, but there you've got a tracing of them. What sparked our interest was that the patina on the, on the rock was considerably darker than lighter exposed calcite, which could be seen nearby in graffiti dated 1704, <coughs> which you'll see is yeah. just there. Quite difficult to see. There you've got some more recent. You can see that the more recent the marks, the lighter and brighter they are. And they are on a calcite covering actually over the top of the rock itself. We photographed the marks and filed them in the mental space labelled interesting and unusual, but didn't draw any conclusions as to their origin. Five months later, however, we came across an article entitled Scare Witch Project, Repairs at Kew Palace Undertake a Tradition of Superstition. This was in The Guardian, which my husband read while in bed one morning, and called out to me, come and look at this, it looks strangely familiar. The article described witch marks, as it referred to them, cut into timbers in the palace. And the, slide, and the text said in the, in the article, to keep witches from flying in at the window or down the chimney. And at that point, our interest was sort of well and truly peaked in the whole thing. The marks had been discovered by the curator during recent renovations. The article quoted him as saying, they had been spotted before, but dismissed as carpenter's marks. But these are quite different, some symbols, eye shapes, M shapes to invoke the protection of the Virgin Mary, classic witch marks, and from exactly the period and in the position near the potential points of danger, the door and window entry points where you would expect to find them. And a photograph of one of the marks was included, an M shape with the middle branches of the letter crossed. The similarity to the markings in Goat Church was immediately apparent, although the ones from the up cave resembled Ws, rather than the end illustrated in the Guardian article. So I contacted the curator, Lee Prosser, who kindly supplied copies of various papers, including one by Timothy Easton, dealing with marks found on timbered beams in old buildings in East Anglia, which referenced marks resembling Ws, possibly two interlocked Vs, which Timothy believes to be marks invoking the protection of the Virgin Mary. This led to collaboration with Timothy on a paper describing the marks and their possible meaning in the Proceedings of the University of Bristol Speleological Society, which you can obtain online. The marks found in Goat Church are all the W or conjoined V mark. They're all small and difficult to see without raking light from the side. They're also all very finely incised and appear to have been made with a metal blade. The marks are all in the immediate vicinity of a feature known in the cave as the giant steps, which is a chimney about seven metres high, which links the upper part of the cave passage to a lower route leading to another entrance owned around 1923. So effectively what you've got is you are going there, there's the giant steps, and that is actually vertical rather than horizontal, and then you've got the lower entrance there. The location of the marks in Goat Church Cavern is consistent to a very large extent with the location of ritual protection marks in buildings. In buildings, they often protect those parts of the dwelling believed to be at risk of en entry by evil spirits and witches' familiars. They're found on or over windows, doors, and chimneys. And their position in the cave follows this trend as the marks are immediately above a hole from which a noticeable cold draught issues. There's also a mark on a boulder immediately facing that. That hole. That one seemed to have missed the one. <coughs> the positioning is believed to be a major indicator of the purpose of the marks. It seems likely that they were placed there in an attempt to prevent something of supernatural origin coming out of the depths of the cave, possibly while someone was using the other part of the cave for shelter. And in that 
uh, slide, slide there, you'll see that Chris is actually working, tracing the W's on the wall there. And just below us down there is the hole from which the draft comes out. And it is quite a considerable draft and it is very cold. So you only have to be standing in that area of the cave, you know, literally for a couple of minutes and you will start to get noticeably colder. The positioning, and whether this, why would somebody do that there? Somebody's in the cave. You know, we were standing in there feeling the cold draft. Somebody else was in there. It's possible, for instance, that they were in there just to take shelter at night because this is actually quite a large cave. Well, how large it was at the time, we don't know, but certainly large, easy enough to get into without having to lie on your belly and wriggle or anything like that. Now, whether that was a temporary occupation by somebody, maybe one night only, maybe for a longer period, we've no way of knowing. But there's an interesting comparison nearby. When in 1793, the Reverend Augustus Montague Toplady, a local minister, took shelter from a thunderstorm beside a limestone outcrop in Burrington Coombe, not far from the bottom of the valley in which Goat Church is found. Ah, oh, that's why I got out of position, sorry. That's the one on the boulder. And there you have the Rock of Ages, in which Top Lady sheltered from a storm, and his experience there inspired him to write the words of the now well-known hymn, Rock of Ages, after which the outcrop is named. You might wonder quite how much shelter, ooh, it's quite how much shelter you get in there with a, a stream running down your neck, but apparently it worked for him. Another possibility is that the marks were made by superstitious local people who viewed the cave as a threatening place, harbouring harmful spirits. Inscribing protective symbols at the point where cold air rises from the depth of the cave could have been an attempt to ensure that the evil remained confined within the cave. We've no means of dating the marks, but we do know that the cave was known locally in 1736, and there is no reason to suppose that the entrance had not been opened for some considerable time before that date. So the marks in Goat Church Cavern very much opened our eyes to the possibility of finding such marks in other caves. So we gave some thought to what caves would have been known at a similar time, and made a visit to Long Hole in Cheddar Gorge. And that's me going up to Long Hole, that's the road down and so that takes you up to the, to the large entrance there. So now you've got quite a difficult route up, needing to be protected by a rope. In the past it was actually easier to get up there. You could take a route from behind the current shadow cave entrance. And so once in the cave, we started to check basically for chimney-like features. What we wanted to work out was could you test the theory? And so they have a large entrance, we wander in, and the first thing you come to very quickly is a large tall chimney that cavers call an Ava. And as we walked up to it, I said, well, this is going to be a good place to take a look. Let's take a, oh, there's something up there. And again, you have a slight cold draft rising up into the chimney. Um, so there I am pointing at something on the wall. What I'm pointing at is that. We promptly came back and did some looking around in the various comparables that we'd been sent and found a notable similarity between that mark and one recorded by Timothy Easton in the Swan Inn at Whirlingworth in Suffolk. You'll see that there, very, very similar, except the P shape is on the other side of the mark, whereas in our case, it was there. By now, our interest was well and truly piqued. An obvious place in need of investigation in this context was a local cave that has been associated with witchcraft legends for hundreds of years, probably the most famous cave in Somerset, Wookie Hole. And the existence of such features, in conjunction with a natural feature such as a chimney, is by no means surprising. And so taking into account our findings in other caves, the surprising thing here, though in Wookie Hole, that my colleague Chris Binding went to, um, and he went in there just basically on a preliminary recce to see what he could see. But he very quickly discovered a large concentration of engravings, many clearly identifiable as ritual protection marks, in a small haven, again you'll spot the similarity here, every time we're finding things in chimney features that go up, you've got the draft coming up on all occasions. And he found a small haven known to show cave guides as the witch's chimney. 
And interestingly, that's actually not recorded anywhere in writing. He was told that by the guides, and as I say, they all call that the witch's chimney. What you have here is this, the entrance to Walking Hole is there. You go down several flights of steps. That's the famous witch of Walking Salad Pie that I'll come back to. The witch's chimney is just a tiny little feature there. You can get about three people in it at once. But very, very quickly again, you start to notice the same thing with your body in there. You quickly set up a convection draft in that you've got warm air rising and it starts to move around like that. You can feel the draft. And I can assure you that after an hour or so working in there, trying to look at the marks, you're very, very cold very quickly. So after the success of Chris's initial foray, we returned and started the long job of cataloguing the marks. And you can see, if you imagine that, that showing the, the size of the wood, which is chimney, it's probably about the size of this desk and another one added to it. So quite small, and these marks all round, mostly at that sort of height. Um, some have been lost in the areas as you enter it, and leave it because the, it was slightly lowered for the show cave path to be able to get through. So you can see where some have actually been cut off by works like that. And all around there we were finding marks, we were finding loads of the conjoined V's, sometimes in connection with other initials, but some of them were cropping up far too frequently just to be, you know, William Wilkinson is on a visit here on whatever. Most of the, the W's, the conjoined V's, were found on their own. And we were finding other marks as well, particularly ones that you'll find cropping up in timbered buildings, the sort of butterfly cross mark you've got there. So all the marks are very finely drawn and very small. Some of them the smallest are less than an inch in height. So quite tiny little marks, some are even smaller, sorry to mix my own metaphors here, but some may be only a centimetre high and really quite difficult to see unless you're looking with an LED torch side lighting as you were looking for graffiti in churches or anywhere else for that matter. Um, nearby we also found more marks towards the entrance as well. We were finding again more of the same we found in Boat Church, the W conjoined V mark, some here quite close together but clearly not done, they were done in different orientations on the rock, clearly done at different times. We also found that fairly close to the entrance, whether that's a, you know, an IH, whether that's part of the, you know, the common IHS, an S is a difficult thing to draw on an uneven rock surface. Um, and again, IH, IHS, IHC, common Christograms, an abbreviation for the name of Jesus Christ. And so, so possibly here they dispensed with the C or S, it really is the hardest to draw a curved letter on an uneven surface. And another common mark found in Wookie Hole is the butterfly cross, sometimes compared with the Dagaz rune, although there seems to be no runic origin to it. But we found several of these, several of the witches' chimney, and again, really small. The nicest one there is probably <coughs> no more than about, you can see there on the scale, really very small indeed. That's not much bigger than my finger. So, as we did with Goat Church, we had to consider Wookie Hole as a context for ritual protection marks. And here there's a very simple and obvious connection with witchcraft. There you've got in the entrance passage now for the visitors to see the witch of Wookie. They sometimes, even in summer, hire somebody to sit in there and pretend to be the witch. <coughs> Apparently it doesn't pay very well, but you don't actually have to do an awful lot. <laughs> Wookie Hole is famous for the large stalagmite known as the Witch of Wookie. And there you'll see her, that's meant to be her face. You'll see the sort of chin, the head. She's also got a little dog somewhere called Dougal. I think he's a later addition. An early account of a visit to the cave by William of Worcester in about 1470 referred to the figure of a woman, and as yet no reference is made to a witch. He describes the figure of a woman clad and holding in her girdle a spinning distaff. In 1628, the first account appears that describes the formation as the Witch of Wookie. A lawyer called Bullstrode Whitelock describes a visit to the cave in company with a guide. 
He was shown, amongst other things, the porter, the witch of Wookiee's holds, stones resembling their names. His visit was by candlelight, and White Clock was clearly relieved when it was over. By 1681, John Beaumont describes the River Axe, from which resurges from the cave, and says, the cattle that feed in the pastures through which this river runs have been known to die suddenly, sometimes after a flood. This is possibly owing to the waters having been impregnated, either naturally or accidentally, with lead ore. Although Beaumont, a man with extensive knowledge of mines and mining, made no connection between the, made the connection between the cattle deaths and the high concentration of lead in the area, it's easy to see how, in such deeply superstitious times, such unexplained cattle deaths could well have been taken as evidence of the association of the cave with the various forces of evil that were believed to play such a large part in visiting trials and tribulations on the world. Later written accounts of the cave demonstrate that by the early 1700s, the story of the witches of which of Wookie Hole was very strongly associated with the cave. By 1748, the witch had even started to make her appearance in poetry, and it's from these poems that we're able to get some glimpses into the local folk magic of the area and the means used to banish evil spirits from dwellings. This is a poem by Anna Sawyer from 1801, which follows a common format and purports to tell an ancient story said to be well known in the area, not by all. The reference here to the witch muttering backwards prayers represents a common belief that witches would misappropriate Christian prayers and turn them into curses by reciting them backwards. And in the early 1800s, a man called John Jennings conducted extensive research into the West Country dialect and also produced a volume of poetry, you can see the title there. In his preface to his 1810 poem, The Mistress of Mendip or The Lost Lady, Jennings says he bases his poem on a well-known superstition in Somerset which tells how to banish troublesome spirits. The poem of the Lost Lady tells the tragic tale of the lovely Lady Blanche, the loved daughter of Sir Archibald of Hospitality Hall. As is usual in such tales, Lady Blanche had two suitors, the nice one and the nasty one. And as it's a tragic tale, naturally Lady Blanche is murdered and her father falls into despair. And when it appears that her spirit has returned to trouble the house, the servants aren't too happy either. And John the butler is sent on a quest to consult the old white who lived far, far away. The old white is naturally a sinister source, as he would be. And when John the butler finds him, the white tears a page out of an old book and starts chanting. You will see here the mention of the Red Sea, which was mentioned just before lunch. No one knows what the words mean until an old dame who lives nearby is consulted. She's a bit more forthcoming than the male counterpart. And she explains how you deal with the troublesome spirits. So here we have evidence of folk belief concerning the banishing of spirits into the cave of Wookie Hall, already believed to be inhabited by a malevolent witch. But that's not all. Spirits have a nasty habit of coming back. But if that happens, our handy old dame has some advice for you. So if it then return, you must pray and command, by midnight, by moonlight, by death's ever want, that to Cheddar Cliffs now it departeth in peace, and another seven years its sore troubling will cease. So now we have our link to the caves in Cheddar Cliffs, including Long Hole, a cave in which ritual protection marks have been found. So our lawn spirit has now been bounced from house to cave to cliff, so far, so good? Maybe. If it will return still, as I warn you it will, to the Red Sea forever command it, and never or noise more or sound in the house shall be found. So, there you have it. Exorcism 101, Somerset Star. The poem provides a vehicle for Jennings to record a superstition which he believed to be well known in Somerset. And for our purposes, Jennings' poem provides a link between Wookie Hole and the caves in the cliffs of Cheddar, all of which sites where we found ritual protection marks. At the time Jennings was writing, there was far less vegetation on the Cheddar cliffs, and so the large open entrance of Long Hole would have been very obvious in the cliff. You can see from that, there it is up behind the current show cave complex. The more puzzling inclusion in the poem is the reference to the Red Sea. Owen Davis cites various examples of this practice in his book The Haunted, A Social History of Ghosts, and we do have other references to the practice in Somerset as a whole. There do appear to be two possible ex explanations for this. The first, and I think probably the most obvious, is that the Red Sea was associated with the drowning of Pharaoh's army in pursuit of Moses and his followers, 
so it might be seen as a place where good triumphed over evil, and thus an appropriate place with containment to troublesome spirits. But I think, honestly, we do need to consider a second explanation for the term, because I have to say the first one doesn't quite wash for me. I think it's possible that the reference to the Red Sea in this context derives from the Hebrew myths that associate Lilith, Adam's first wife, with the Red Sea, a region where demons were said to have abounded, in which Lilith then added two with her own children. And it's been suggested that Lilith's flight to the Red Sea after a dispute with Adam recalls a Hebrew view that water attracts demons. And as an explanation for the practice of banishing spirits to the Red Sea, personally I believe the connection with the folklore surrounding Lilith can't be discounted. So to conclude, we believe the marks found in the Mendip Caves are ritual protection marks. We think that's borne out by their positioning and by their resemblance to marks found elsewhere. And comparison with marked symbols found in timbered buildings do demonstrate that connection. The similarities do seem to be too numerous to allow any other conclusion to be reached. The marks have been found in Goat Church Cavern, Long Hole and in Wookie Hole, with by far the greatest number appearing in the latter, a cave that has been associated with stories of witchcraft since at least 1728. In other contexts, the meaning of the array of marks illustrated here has been hotly debated by researchers, with some kind of claiming that these types of marks are nothing more than carpenter's marks or mason's marks, and that there's no arcane motive for them. However, as Owen Davis states in his chapter in the recent book, The Materiality of Magic, if the same symbols crop up on other surfaces, then one can elim eliminate carpenter's and mason's marks and bright marks or timber marks. He goes on to say, they, myself and my colleague Chris Binding, have found incised marks carved into the rock, probably dated from the 16th to the 18th century, in contexts that cannot serve any construction or building purpose. And in our view, the, slides provide, the marks provide a very direct physical link between the prevalence of witch belief in the area and attempts made to obtain some measure of protection from malevolent spirits. And if you'll forgive the pun, Chris Binding and I believe that we've only just started to scratch the surface of the instances of protective marks in caves and mines, and that the underground world has a very definite part to play in the study of ritual protection marks and other magical practices. Thank you. Any questions? Because where it is, it's kind of at shoulder height as we're going down to that portion of the cave. And so people, probably cavers, the cave itself is very, very well visited, often by scout groups, um, by parties of novice cavers. And so people will rub against the rock. Whether or not it's been specifically kind of touched in that context is difficult to tell. It's certainly been rubbed, been rubbed against. Um, the marks, in, you, see, you can see, we've compared it to the other caves. The more recent the graffiti in that context, the brighter it will be. And part of our background is from looking at things in a cave art context. So we were fairly used to, to actually being able to tell from, to some extent, what you can tell from the patina of the markings and the amount of rubbing. They, they will become brighter when they're wetter. You find this a lot in a cave context. When, when it's very wet, they'll really stand out. When it's quite dry, they can be incredibly difficult to see. And we've worked on that panel numerous times, and very occasionally we have to play Hunt the Mark, in which it will take us at least five minutes to find what we're looking for. Do you know if the marks can be sort of dated to the geological context? Because normally, when we live in Nottinghamshire, the Croswell, they've managed to date the paintings on the rock by geologically measuring the flow depth. Yes. Over in, in this case, though, what you need to be able to do that sort of, of dating is you need a calcite flow yeah. over the engraving. Here we've got the marks incised into the calcite, okay. but there's no discernible flow over the top. Right. Okay. And so, no, we, we can't date by any sort of absolute or, or empirical means as to what it is. You can really go by what it looks like, how long the cave's been open, yeah. obviously, because the first thing looking for any sort of mark like this, isn't it? There's no point in looking at something where the entrance was discovered three years ago last Tuesday. Yeah. If, it, you know, if it's a totally new breakthrough, you need entrances that have been open at the relevant time. Okay. 
deliver the advocacy in the darkness. Um, quite interesting, uh, you've got your examples in caves, um, Somerset, and example, similar examples in buildings in East Anglia and Kew. Are there examples elsewhere in the buildings? In buildings? Yes, I believe they're fabulous. I, I, I've certainly seen them in various areas of the country. Um, I probably need to look to Brian on this one, but I think they're pretty much ubiquitous everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also certainly found the same marks, for instance, in central France. Hi, firstly, um, it's been a really great listen to you speaking there. Um, I've read your articles before, and I found it extremely useful in countering the, the old Elvin Mr. Carpenter's marks criticism, both in sort of online mm -hmm. and also in conversation with people. So thank you very much for putting that out there. Brilliant. Along with sort of the study of art, with it's been absolutely brilliant to sort of take people away from that. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of to answer your comment about um, uh, are they found in buildings? I've been in probably over a hundred buildings looking at these things now, and as long as it's sort of before about eighteen hundred, I always find them. So yeah, they are really, really, really common, definitely. Um, uh, so sort of question I wanted to ask though really was um, the. Um, the, the cage you looked at, you looked at a sample of three. If you looked at other caves in the region as well, are uh, you building up a picture yes. that, that virtually every cave has got these in? Or, or what sort of sense are you looking at? Not all of them. I mean, there are other caves in, in, um, in Cheddar, for instance, that were open at the relevant period where we haven't found them. But equally, we've found them in more places than not. The ones I was using particularly for the Cheddar and Wookiee was really to be able to bring in the folklore and, and explain possibly to an extent why there were so many in Wookiee Hole and why we also have so many up in Long Hole as well because you've got the link with the banishing and, and the story. But yes, and they're also coming up in other parts of the country. People previously had dismissed a lot of this as simply initials. You know, William Wilberforce or whoever he was got everywhere, did an awful lot of W's. Um, same with you. Yeah, it's statistically improbable and most of them you find as a single mark. Uh, we're also getting examples now from mines. We've been given photographs of one in the Merston mines in Surrey, quite down at the far end of a stone mine. And so and I think we're certainly getting instances of miners having made marks, often in quite some, you know, quite some distance from the entrance. And the nice thing about the marks is actually they do very much run true to form. If you think, oh, look, there's an Avon a chimney, we go to them and that's where we find them. So it's always nice when things behave the way they should do. I think it makes sense. If you're doing protective marks in your house, why not do it in caves? Because we do know that some of the caves weren't lived in on and off. Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. for quite a long period. And certainly people did go in and out of them. You can and tell by the amount of the graffiti in the caves. Yes. That people were in and out of these very regularly. We found graffiti going back to 1600 well, in I mean, a couple of parts the caves. Of the world where people actually lived in, you know, whole cliffs with caves yeah. in. Yes. So, so I'm sure it was the same here. Yeah. Um, if it's any, uh, you know, atmosphere, I always, we always went to Cheddar Cave when I was little, and I was quite happy there, but I never, we, I think we only went to Wookie once, and I didn't like it in there. But, and I don't know whether it was, you know, that it was because they mentioned the witch, but I didn't like the feeling of that mm -hmm. cave. It wasn't friendly Some at caves all. do have very different feelings, I totally agree. So definitely mm -hmm. As part of the uh, medieval graffiti survey, those uh, marks we have been able to date, it kind of links with times of social stress was the road the English Civil War, Napoleonic Wars, you can kind of group them in dates. Is there anything around that area sort of uh, where there was a time of social stress that possibly you could link those two? I think yes, you're basically linking it into the witch trials. We've got documented witch trials in the area during what we think is the relevant period for those caves being open. And so I think that's linking to what's actually happening outside in the area as well. Right. I think I'm probably done. Back here as well. Back, back. Okay, call me when you're ready, but I want to finish. <laughs> uh, Steve, do you have any um, suggestions for any kind of interpretation?
Mm, I think really there I can honestly only fall back on the work of other people um, to talk about Timothy's work comparing the W's to um, a, a mark possibly invoking the Virgin Mary. Uh, personally, I would like to do more of a statistical analysis in terms of the grouping of initials, uh, of combinations of letters that make up initials, just to see if there may be some initials or whether or not it is some form of Christogram or some sort of uh, interpretation that we simply don't know now. I mean, we get a lot of the cross eyes, whether or not that is a Christogram just for the first name of Jesus. I really couldn't say, so I'd sort of stay slightly away from any actual interpretation of the symbols other than their general protective context. I think I'm out of time looking at the, uh, the clock at the back, if I can just about see it. Thank you very much. Thank you.